a couple years ago, we started this series, and then we took a break from it and came back to it, and a break from it and came back to it. And today is the last day of our Dysfunctional Lovable Church series. And uh, I am, as I, as I look at, at the last, you know, the whole book of 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, a series we've done, if you uh, want to go back and catch up on any of these sermons, you can do so on our Mosaic Church of Grand Rapids YouTube page or on our audio podcast. And the, what I'm comforted by from Corinthians is that the church has always been dysfunctional. Right? We, we, we look at the church today and we say it is so dysfunctional, as if, as if somehow that means God is not on the throne, or if somehow it means the gospel has lost its power because the church today is dysfunctional, and we forget that we're part of the church. Like we, We're part of that dysfunction, right? And it's just a great reminder to know that even when the first church, Church of Corinth was one of the first churches that were started from the jump, they were dysfunctional. And, and that's why it's important that we have Scripture, it's important we have the Holy Spirit, it's important that we have each other, but I'm reminded that the church is both lovable and dysfunctional, and that it is us. It is us. So um, I was thinking about, the as we uh, get into our text today, uh, the, the discussion question that you had about New Year's Eve resolutions. Uh, this is middle of September. We're now into the later September, September 22nd, and I hate to break it to you, but New Year's Eve isn't that far away. I know that's kind of sad and depressing. Here's why. I think fall is the best weather in Michigan. Anyone agree with me on that? We have any fall weather lovers? The problem with fall weather is you know what's coming. <laughs> you know what comes next. Fall is hard to enjoy because you know that in a blink of an eye, it will be gone and winter will be here. It's just the calm before the storm the calm before the snowstorm. There's this, this ominous feeling that the weather is coming, but it is coming. So New Year's is coming. Soon you'll be doing your New Year's resolutions if you do those. And I bet you that somebody's New Year's resolution uh, in here or in the world is, I'm going to get strong. I'm going to go to the gym. You know, I, I go to the gym year-round, and I can tell you that in January, the gym is very crowded. The gym is overcrowded in January, pretty much only in January. You know why that is? Everybody makes their New Year's resolution that they're going to get strong. But by the time February comes, you're like, eh, you know, maybe I'm good. <laughs> maybe I'm all right. Maybe, that, maybe next year. Maybe next year. But this is a very common New Year's resolution to get strong. I'm betting you that very few of anyone has ever made this your New Year's resolution. You know what, this year, I think I'm going to get weak. I think I'm going to just see how weak I can get, how weak I can get my body to be, my muscles to be. I think I'm good, right? Or your question about the job interview, I'm betting that uh, when you talk through what someone would say in a job interview to get a job, nobody said this. Nobody said, yeah, I'm a weak employee. I'm, I'm, I'm weak. I, I just... I have a lot of issues. I have a lot of problems. Uh, you, should, you should hire me, though. Uh, you probably wouldn't put this on your resume. Here's all my qualifications. I am weak. This is not something that we would make a goal in our lives as Americans, right? We, if, um, we don't want to be weak. If we are weak, then we hide our weakness, right? If we're weak, we fake it like we're not weak, we don't show anybody. We don't want to show our weakness because what would happen if we did? What if I told you this morning that you had to choose between your strength or Christ's strength, that it was an either or, you had to choose one or the other? I think most of us here would probably say, if you're, if you're a follower of Jesus, you'd say, I want Christ's strength. If I had you raise your hands, I think most of us would say, I choose Christ's strength over my strength, right? We would probably, we would probably say that. Well, here's something that'll blow your mind. The path to that strength is through our weakness. The path to strength is through weakness. That's what we're going to look at this morning. Last week, Pastor Darrell preached on the same passage that I'm preaching on today, uh, 2 Corinthians 12, 7 to 10. These are 
some of my most favorite passages of Scripture, and I get to continue uh, to keep going on what Pastor Daryl started last week. He got to do a mini-sermon for Fall Fest. I'm doing a mini-sermon today at the breakfast. Last week, these were Pastor Daryl's three points of going through the text. Number one, thorns keep us humble. Number two, God answers prayers differently. Number three, we don't hide our weaknesses. And that brings us into this concept of weakness. I get to give you point number four today as we look at 2 Corinthians 12, 7 through 10. This, for me, is one of the richest, I would say, most life-changing passages of Scripture in the whole Bible. So here's point number four. Christ's power and grace comes through our weakness. So that's what we're going to look at. What does that mean for me today? Christ's power and His grace comes through our weakness. So before we get to the, the, the text, uh, I want to ask you, because I'm a comic book fan, Marvel Comics. Sorry, Robbie. Robbie's a DC guy, even though he's got a Marvel mug, so we pre- we, we're working on him. Uh, when, if you're watching an Avengers movie, when do the Avengers show up? They, they show up when New York City, you can see behind them, is burning to the ground. They show up when there's aliens shooting through the sky in outer space. They show up when there's portal holes opening in the sky, and Thanos' army is, is coming through the portal hole to take over all of planet Earth. In these moments, and I know I'm crisscrossing movies here, Avenger uh, movie nerds, I know I'm doing that, I apologize. This picture just had a little more pop to it, Pastor Daryl. I like that picture. It's colorful, okay? A little more pop. That's all. I know. I know. I know. I, I'm crossing fibers there. I know that's an that's a Old Testament law. I'm not supposed to do that, but I'm doing that. Okay. When, when, when Thanos' army is coming through the sky, aliens from outer space are coming, me as a normal human citizen of Grand Rapids, Michigan, I'm saying, yes, please, Avengers, help us. I, this is a bit over my head, right? Will you feel me on this? This is when the Avengers show up. Now, this is me last year at the Fall Fest. I ate all these pancakes. You think that's true, Alan? Alan made this picture. It was very funny. He put it on, he put it on Facebook and asked people if uh, those were real pancakes or not. All right, if I am trying to open a pickle jar in my kitchen, and I... I Let's say I haven't even tried to open it yet. I pull the pickle jar out of the fridge. I'm like, I'm going to have some pickles, not necessarily with my pancakes. Okay, that's just because it's breakfast Sunday, and so we we went with that. But I'm going to have some pickles on my hamburger. I pull out the the pickle jar. Well, that's the these are the long ones. I'm thinking of the sliced ones. Okay, so whatever, it doesn't matter. I pull it out of my fridge, and all of a sudden, out of nowhere, the Avengers show up in my kitchen, and 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 uh, Captain America's like, yo yo, I'm a super soldier. Let me open that pickle jar for you. I'm like, bro. I am offended that you don't think I can open a pickle jar. I have got this. Like, go away. I am, I'm going to do a selfie or something. That's cool. That's fine. But don't touch my pickle jar. Don't insult my manhood. I am fine. I can open a pickle jar on my own. Like, go away. I'm strong. You feel me? Like, I'm strong. I got this pickle jar. This is not where I need the Avengers interfering into my life. I think we think that about God a lot of times. We're like, yo, God, I'm good. I've got this. I'm strong. You go away. You do your thing. I'm going to do my thing. But what if this is the scene, and I'm in the middle of the endgame battle, and there's alien spaceships all around me, and Thanos' army has surrounded me, and in that moment, I say, yo, Avengers, go away. I'm offended that you're here. I've got this. I'm strong. I think I've got things covered. What's going to happen? I am dead. I am gone. I cease to exist, and so is all of earth if I think I am the solution to this problem. Does that make sense? All right, the proper response in this situation would be, help, I am weak. I cannot do this on my own, and then I could be saved. Right? When I cry out for someone to save me because I'm in over my head, then I can be saved. And I think we do this in our spiritual lives all the time time. This is for those who are considering accepting Jesus as their Savior to save them from their sins, but it's for those who have been walking with Jesus for decades and decades, and we need help, and we refuse to get it because we think, I'm good, I'm strong, I'm not weak, I'm not talking about my weakness, I'm talking about my strength, I don't need anyone around me to help me because I have got this. 
All right, so let's check out our passage again, 2 Corinthians 12, 7 through 10. Paul's writing, he says, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties, for when I am weak, then I am strong. So, real quick, he, uh, the yellow there on, in verse 7, he says he's got this thorn in his flesh, doesn't say what it is, and that it is tormenting him. That is a very vivid word. Think about something in your life that is tormenting you. That is a very picturesque word that he uses. Three times he does what? He pleads with God. Can you picture the Apostle Paul pleading with God? I would get down on my knees and act like I'm pleading, but my knees hurt because I've had too many knee surgeries, and I can't do that right now. But I want you to picture the Apostle Paul pleading on his knees, pleading with his face down before God, take this thorn from me. Can you relate to that in your prayer life? God, take this thorn from me. Fix this circumstance. Fix this sin issue in my life that I can't fix. Fix this relational problem in my life that I can't fix. Fix this injustice issue in the world or in my life that I can't fix. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. We often think there's a formula to prayer, and if you get the formula right, boom, God will give you everything that you ask for in that prayer, just get the formula right. This is the Apostle Paul. He wrote half the New Testament. Did he not have the formula right? Maybe there's something more that we are to discover about how God answers prayer or how he is even with us. It's not, not necessarily about even prayer, but about every aspect of our walk with Jesus. Jesus says to Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. My grace is sufficient for you. What that means is whatever your circumstance is, pray it, bring it to me. We don't know how God's going to answer that prayer, but we do know that one of his answers, the primary answer, the main answer is his grace. He gives you his grace. Grace is more than just the forgiveness of your sin. Grace is that he is with you, that he loves you. He is the, he is the answer to your prayer. The, the answer to your prayer is Jesus himself. Jesus' presence is the answer to your prayer. The blessing we seek from God is himself. It was the same way in the Old Testament. The blessing of God wasn't some material blessing. It was the presence of God, that we find our peace in God's presence, not in our circumstance. How many times has, I need my circumstance to change, become my God, versus my God being my God? Let me say that again. How many times has, I need my circumstance to change, become my God, instead of my God being my God. He says, for my power is made perfect in weakness. And that's what I want us to land on this morning. How do I tap into that grace that is sufficient, that grace that is enough for me despite my circumstance? It has to do with my weakness. When you admit you can't do it on your own, God says, is when you can let me do it for you. So if you think you can do it on your own, and you're, you're grabbing, and you're clutching, and you're, you're, you're I'm going to do that. I don't need help. God's like, okay, I guess you're good. I guess you got it covered. When I admit my weakness, then Jesus' strength can come and be the solution. So Paul hears this from Jesus, and he goes all in. He starts publicly declaring his weakness. He boasts about his weakness. And I will say this, in my almost four decades of walking with Jesus, my two decades of pastoring, this is where I see healing in my life and in people's life. I see healing when we are vulnerable with God and with others about our weaknesses. 
when I am vulnerable with another brother or sister in Christ about my weaknesses, whether that is depression, anxiety, pornography, coping mechanisms, insecurity, temptation, discontentment, if I keep all those things in me and say, I'll fix this myself because I'm so strong, guess what? I'm dead. I can't fix it myself. When I go to a brother or sister in Christ, when I confess my sins to another, when someone else can embody Jesus' love for me and support me in my weakness, that is when I experience the strength of God in my life. When we say, I can't do it alone, when I, when I say, I can't do it alone, that's when I open myself up for healing. That's when I open myself up for the strength of Jesus to come into my life. I don't know what that is for you this morning, but we all have something. We all have some things. could be your marriage. It could be your relationship with the Lord. It could be your level of faith. It could be alcohol abuse. It could be drug abuse. It could be pornography. It could be selfishness, greed. It could be things that are outside of your control like depression and anxiety, but you're trying to fix them yourself. So this morning, as we wrap up this series, this is a call to you to stop faking it. When we try to fake it, like, we're good, I got this covered, that's where Satan wants us. Because as long as we isolate, that thing just spirals more and more and more. And we think we can just bury it deeper and deeper under the carpet. When we do that, we don't get to experience grace. You know all grace is? It's saying, I'm messed up. I need forgiveness. Isn't that not the first step of becoming a Christian? I need forgiveness. You think that changes? <laughs> 10, 20 years later, we st we're still messed up. We still need forgiveness. We still need God. So my challenge to you this morning is to go, it, it's going to look different for each of us. What would it look like for you to start going to see a counselor? What would it look like for you to join a small group at Mosaic? What would it look like for you to initiate accountability in your life, to approach someone you already know, someone in your small group, someone from church, and say, I need some accountability in my life? Could you do that with me? Could we talk once a week? Could we have some questions that we go through? You have two options. One of them is to be weak and admit it. The other one is to be weak and wear a mask. That's it. There are no other options than that. You decide which of those you're going to choose. Our culture, it forces us to isolate. We're the most isolated culture of all time, the most individualistic culture of all time. We have to fight back against the isolation of our culture. So first I want to say props to everyone in this room for being here at church. Amen. You're here. You're here. Because culture tells you to isolate. Culture tells you, you don't need this. You don't need those people. You don't need God. You're here. Props to those of you that were here last week and that will be here next week. Props to you that are saying, I need community in my life. I need people in my life. Props to those that have joined a small group. Props to those that go to a counselor. Props to those that do addiction recovery groups. Props to those that have accountability partners and online software on their, their phones and on their computers so there's, there's accountability around what we're viewing online. Christ's power and grace comes through our weakness. I'm telling you right now, I, Pastor Noah, need help. I have all those things that I listed. I go to addiction recovery groups. I have accountability software on my phone. I am in a small group. I lead a small group. I come to church. I need you. I need people. I need God's strength. I am weak. Maybe it's just me that's weak. I don't know. Maybe everyone else is good. Maybe you guys figured it out. That's Satan's lie, isn't it? You're the only one that's weak. No, <laughs> we're all weak. We all need help. I hope to model that in leadership, in vulnerability to say we all need help. We all need to be vulnerable. Find a safe space to be vulnerable. The path to maturity is to admit that we're weak. The path to maturity is to get help. The path to maturity is not, I'm so strong I don't need help. <laughs> no, no, that's immaturity. The path to maturity is, I am weak, and I'm reaching out for help. That is the path of strength. The path of freedom 
The path of strength is to stop isolating. It's to connect in community, and it is to be vulnerable. This is when Christ's power can show up in a situation like the end game battle. Christ can show up and save the day. I'm a sinner. I need help. Does that sound familiar? I'm a sinner. I need help. That's, you probably heard that when the gospel is presented, and it's true for all of us. You're a sinner. You need help. You need Jesus to save you. You can't save yourself. Versus, I'm a sinner. I've got this covered. I'm a sinner. I've got this covered. You ain't getting saved. That's not, how, <laughs> that's not how salvation works. And like I said earlier, 10 years later, 20 years later, 40 years later, I'm still a sinner and I still need help. We remember it in our evangelism. We forget it in our discipleship in the church. So what is your next step? It's going to look different for different people, but I want you to take a moment. What is your next step? Is it to come back next Sunday? Is it to grab that small group clipboard? Where'd the small group clipboard end up? Right there. Benji's got it over there. We'll leave it, we'll leave it on the table over there, uh, or we'll bring it up here to the front maybe to grab that clipboard before you leave and say, you know what? I think I'm going to try one of these groups. Is it to start some accountability questions with people you already know? Is it to call a therapist? Is it to reach out to a pastor? What is your next step? I want to invite you into vulnerability. I want to invite you in and give you hope to say there is hope for you. You don't have to do it alone. You are not alone. Christ's power and grace comes through our weakness. Let me pray uh, over you. We don't have the band up here today, uh, but I just want to pray. I want to give you a moment to just let the Spirit speak to you of what your next step is. We have connection cards at the table. If that's something you want to share with myself and leadership team of what your next step is, you can put that on your connection card. But let me just give you a moment uh, in, at your seat to reflect on what is your next step. We'll play a little bit of music in the background and just give you a moment to ask the Holy Spirit what your next step is. So I know we're still in like meal mode and, and kind of fun, silly mode. If you could all just kind of quiet yourselves and not talk to the people next to you for a moment, uh, just give yourself maybe one minute before the Spirit to speak to you of what is your next step of being vulnerable, reaching out, finding strength in Christ through your weakness. Let's pray together. Um, Lord, thank you that you want to free us. You, you want to bring us hope and freedom. And for those that have been burying things under the carpet, maybe things they've never told anybody, uh, things they've been battling that they thought they could do on their own, Lord, today just give release them. Give them boldness and courage to take that next step, whatever it may be. If they grew up in an a, a environment where going to counseling was stigmatized somehow as being weak or for those types of people, God, today they'd say, you know what, I am weak. Because <laughs> when I'm weak is when I'm strong in Christ that they would take that step. If it's joining a group, if it's reaching out to a friend to set up some accountability, Lord, may they do that today. May they say, yeah, I want freedom from this. I want to join that, I want to join that group that's seeking maturity that gets this, this strength from Christ when we admit our weakness. So I, just, I pray for that release in this room. I pray that for our teenagers, that they would know they're not alone. I pray they would, they would reach out to uh, Pastor Mario, to one of the youth leaders, to, uh, to another leader here at Mosaic. Lord, they don't have to do it alone. They don't, have to, they don't have to go through this season of their teenage years alone trying to figure this stuff out on their own. They can follow you. They can shine light in the darkness. They can lean on others. They can lean on other believers and reach out, and they will not be judged. God, for anyone in this room to know that the response is not going to be judgment. The response is grace. That's what grace is. It's admitting that we need help. It's admitting that we've sinned. And, and the response is grace and love and acceptance. And may everyone in this room know that. We thank you for the love and acceptance that we have in the gospel, that we have in you, Jesus. Thank you for freeing us from our sins. May we continue for the rest of our lives to make this our lifestyle, to boast about our weakness, to share our weakness with others so we can find strength in you for freedom and hope. Thank you, Jesus. Amen.